Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, this is Greg Unninger, and we have some friends with us today. Brian and Joseph, do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure. Um, I'm Brian Broom. I'm a member of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Roseville, California. Went to Cornerstone Christian School and uh, sat under Greg's teaching and all the rest of y'all are my fellow alumni. Yes, that's the plural. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I'm Joseph. I'm uh, insert same details as Brian. I am also an English major and am therefore poor. <laughs> we didn't charge him the entry fee to get on the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, the welfare uh, is appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> David's like, you're getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> Why did nobody tell me this? <laughs> We're super glad to have you guys with us today. Quick summary for those listening for the first time, and this is like episode two, so it's everybody's almost first time. Uh, Halting Toward Zion is a discussion of world history, biblical theology, Christian civilization, and education, and everything else that comes up as we talk about those things. Today, we are talking about... Genesis 1. Genesis, one. of course! What else Let's would we be doing? We are starting at the very beginning with Genesis 1 1. And six years later, we'll be in Genesis 1 2. <laughs> yeah. As my friends here can testify, I have this reputation of starting in Genesis and never getting out of it. In fact, never getting <laughs> out of the first three chapters. In fact, never getting out of the first chapter and taking a very long time to get out of the first verse. We're, we're going to do some magic and do all of Genesis 1 1 now. <laughs> will wonders never cease yeah the, the end times must indeed be upon us <laughs> for those of you who have never opened a bible or don't remember which end you started in genesis is the first book it's the very beginning the first chapter the first verse yes the bible has chapters and verses unlike say war and peace or a graphic novel and that very first sentence is in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth. Seems like sort of a rather obvious opening if you're going to write a book where God's the author. If God's going to write a book, that seems a good place to begin. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The thing that makes it so profound is it is obvious to exactly one religion, one philosophy, one worldview in all of human history, that which we call the book of Christianity. Every other religion, every other philosophy, every other worldview rejects this idea of a single God who creates out of nothing or into nothing as preposterous, impossible, irrational, and something that we're not going to tolerate around here at all. So we need to talk about this. We need to talk about why the Bible begins there, what it means, and why no one else likes the idea, even a little bit. From a literary standpoint, at the very least, you got a uh, pretty darn good thesis statement going on right there. <laughs> <laughs> This is so. This is so. Basically, we, we... Uh, gives you all the arguments of the Bible right up front, <laughs> all the presuppositions in uh, one sentence. In one sentence, you know, we have literarily, or in terms of storytelling, we have our our hero, we have our setting, we have the general atmosphere of the thing, which is one of wonder, and the setting is both temporal and positional. In the beginning, and where? Well, the story's broad: heaven and earth. And there's no background information that we need to fill in, as far as we know yet. We're going to find out later on that before the world began, before time was, God did some planning and some communicating and some conversing, but that's for later. So, we're, as you say, starting at the very beginning, and the basic elements that we need are here. I think that one of the things that we should point out just in passing is that God does not say, uh, I, hi, I'm God, and I, I want to convince you of my existence so that we can have a fruitful conversation. So let me lay before you <laughs> seven lines of rational argumentation and ten uh, empirical evidences that will convince you that it's really me and not Fred next door on his ham radio. In this doctoral thesis, I will prove that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, God does not feel any need to prove who he is, what he is, or why we should trust him. He simply begins his book by saying, I'm God, I'm the creator. And, then, and we need to look at that word creator now. 
because as you read through philosophies and religious histories and cultural anthropologies, you'll see a lot about origin myths. And sometimes they're called creation myths, but they're not creation myths. They're origin myths. Uh, as you look at one after another, where you're, whether you're looking at mythology in Egypt or Sumer or Greece and Rome or Scandinavia or even the Aztec uh, mythology from, from Mexico, in each case, we start with a pre-existent world, a chaos, a cosmic egg, um, eternal waters, something's there. Two random particles that smash into each other. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There, there is some kind of pre-existent matter or substance that may or may not be sentient. It doesn't really matter because sentience generally enters in at some point. So either it's it, there's a dualism from the beginning or whatever is evolves some sort of sentience. And it doesn't matter a whole lot. Uh, and then the the origin myths tell us how this stuff, this mess, this chaos whatever words the, the myth assigns to it, begins to develop into the world we recognize. But the assumption is that the stuff was there. And unlike Genesis 1-1, where God created the world and all of these other myths, and these other things which are myths, the universe created the gods. They are part and parcel of the universe. They're an extension of the basic reality that's already there. They're, they're a development out of it or within it. And there's no, there is no creator. Genesis, the Bible, says that there was God, and there was nothing else above God, beyond God, back of God, no uh, probability, no forces, no sentience, no abstract ideals, no, no um, ideal forms to which God might appeal as a template, no other gods beside him with whom he might kibitz and uh, plan. There was simply God, and then God, out of the wonder, the joy, the power, the wisdom of his heart, created into what was nothing something. And we, we can solve a Greek issue here. Is nothing something? No, nothing was nothing. There really was nothing. Collapsed three-dimensional universe, erase time uh, as we know it, get rid of matter, get rid of color, get rid of motion. There was just God. And only God can conceive of what that's like. But God was living. God is living. God is life. It was not a static abstraction. All we can say is what the Bible says, that God is eternal love. And we can, in another podcast, I assume we'll talk about the Trinity. The three persons of the Trinity were there, loving one another, communicating with one another, the Father breathing forth the Spirit to the Son, and the Son breathing forth the Spirit to the Father, and together enjoying one another, rejoicing in one another, and planning what they were going to do. And then they did it. And that's creation, creation out of nothing, creatio ex nihilo. And that means we got a sovereign God going on. We have a God who brought everything out of nothing except, well, it's not nothing because he created, he's there. But he didn't use anything. He didn't use pieces and parts. He didn't tap it in any reserves. He, by his sheer power, his sheer wisdom, his sheer love, made the world that we know in all of its temporal and spatial dimensions and with its material substance. No other religion gives us that. And that means that this God of ours is someone we have to stand back in awe of and say, we don't understand you. You are incredible. You are amazing in the proper sense of the word. And if he did not speak to us, we would be lost. We, we, we'd, we would not be able to lay any kind of grasp on him, Although he, but he does. He reveals himself to us. He speaks to us. Um, silently in the very creation, the heavens declare the glory of God, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that we're without, we're without excuse. Uh, the heavens declare his righteousness, all the people see his glory. We get this over and over again. Jesus is the light that lights every man into the world. We are not without revelation. The creation shouts revelation around us. And if we didn't have that, we wouldn't understand God. And so we can't box this God up and say, well, if I were God, I wouldn't do such and such. Or if I were God, I would make sure that such and such happen. We can say that, and we do a lot. We, we are in no place to do that. Mm -hmm. God transcends our sensibilities. And yet he reveals himself in such a way that we can say, this pleases God. This does not please God. God declares this to be true. God declares this to be false. 
And he does it in such a way that we can really understand. It's a bumper sticker I've mentioned a number of times. Uh, God is too great to be caught in any one religion. The idea is God is so great, we can't say anything about him. He can't even reveal himself. Christianity says God is so great, he actually can. <laughs> Despite the incredible distance between us, he actually can reveal himself. He can poke into this world of time and space and matter and reveal himself in words that make sense to him and to us, although, although those words will never exhaust all that he is. But we can have, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, true truth about God and about his universe. So he communicates to us while remaining distinct from the created world. Uh, Van Til called that the creator-creature distinction in contradistinction to the Greek idea of the continuity of being. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I seem to be doing that a lot lately. Uh, and it involves metaphors of cream of wheat and swimming pools. Both, <laughs> back, both echoes so of my years. I, I, I knew you would be. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my mom made cream of wheat, which I really, really loved until she started not stirring it properly. And there were these big kernels of uncooked cream of wheat that you would bite into. But it was the cream of wheat. The struggle is real. The struggle <laughs> is real. This is my childhood also. Yes. Yes. See, it's a real thing. But the whole thing is cream of wheat. It's just that some of the cream of wheat was more cream of wheaty than others. But anywhere you went, whether into the lumps or into the far periphery of this thing within the bowl, it's all cream of wheat. It's all continuous in its cream of wheatness. But some of it's lumpier than others. So that. Now, imagine a whole swimming pool full of cream of wheat. We had a swimming pool. We were the one of the few homes in our neighborhood back in the early 60s that actually had a swimming pool, a built-in concrete kind of thing. And so sometimes you just sit in the swimming pool when it's late and you're sweaty and there's no one's over. And you sit in the corner near the uh, circulator. It's just pumping out water into the pool. And you want to do something that requires absolutely no energy. So sitting there, you just kind of start moving your arms on the top of the water up and down, up and down, up and down. Because the water, or cream of wheat if it were there, uh, is all of a piece, you move a little here, eventually the waves start propagating and you start moving it all. And it doesn't take very long, even a small child will figure out, to if you move your waves in the water, your, your arms in the water, you start up waves that pretty soon have the entire swimming pool thrashing and gushing and swaying and splashing out. And Dad coming out and saying, stop wasting the water in the swimming pool. That costs money. Because <laughs> this is California. Because this is California. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, continuity of being. Here's the thing. If, it's, if all of reality is of a piece, there are a couple things we can say about it. One, it's all alike, but some of it's more alike than others. Some of it has more stuff, more reality, more substance than others. Some animals are more equal than others? Well, some animals are more equal than others, and some humans are more equal to the animals than others. And then you begin climbing up this mythical chain of being where you go from dirt to grass to insect to animal to man to angel to heroes to demigods to godlings to little gods, to medium gods, to bigger gods, to what? The entire universe in its self deification Because it's all the same stuff. We're all, um, by nature, God. It's just we, other God, other parts of the universe are more, have more God stuff than we do, and others have less. And depending upon the religion, the worldview, it may be, you may be stuck where you are, just being sort of, sort of divine. But more often than not, you will be provided with some kind of key that will allow you to ascend upward on this ladder of being and become more divine as you recognize what is already true, that you are gods and you better get used to it. Now, back to the thrashing around in the pool. Because of this, because the universe is of a piece, all of it is reflected in each part, and each part has the ability to touch all. When the ancient world had a word for this, it was called magic. If all of the universe is reflected down into the smallest thing, then it makes sense that you could read the whole course of nature in tea leaves in the bottom of a cup, in the spots on a bird's liver, in the flight of a bird's, in the reflections in a crystal, in the uh, random um, casting of um, I Ching sticks, or whatever. Anything could reflect everything because everything's apart. And, you know, today we, we have similar analogies we can make with 
little chips in our cars. If you tap into it, it will tell you the entire history of the car and everything it's doing and everything that's going wrong. But we, we approach that scientifically. We say there are mathematical rules and consistencies, but magic was a little more free-flowing, and it was enough to know that everything is involved in everything else, but that very involvedness might mean that things aren't exactly what you think they are, and so it requires great experience and expertise and wisdom to be able to read the tea leaves well. Not everybody can do it. Secret knowledge. Secret knowledge. And then it goes the other way. Once you once you have the little in your hand, the little crank, the little touchstone, the little button, you can crank the wheels that turn the universe. You, by your little ritual over in this obscure corner, can do things that can topple empires, slay kings, bring comets into the skies. Anything's possible if you know how it works. And so, yes, back to secret knowledge, esoteric knowledge, um, continuity of being opens up the possibility of divination and magic, and every religion in the history of the world has to some degree, if it doesn't start there, it's ended up there. We end up going in some fashion for complete domination of the universe, a complete understanding of the universe, despite the obvious fact that we're little, little puny human beings who don't know everything. But since we're God in the making, or, or God in simply by nature, we ought to know everything. We ought to be able to do everything. The future should be open before us. We ought to be great. We should make a name for ourselves. Maybe we built a building that was really tall. That would <laughs> give it away somehow. So, yeah, continuity of being. Dr. Van Til speaks of, speaks of the creator-creation distinction. Uh, his, uh, his friend at uh, the Episcopal Seminary in Philadelphia, across town, Dr. Rudolph, um, whereas Van Til, as I understand, would draw a line and say, at least this is what I do when I'm imitating him, creator above, creation below, and make it the line really dark so you can understand there's no crossing. God doesn't become man, man doesn't become God. Dr. Rudolph would draw two circles. You put God in one and creation in the other and say, notice what's with these circles. Well, they're two circles. Exactly. Do these two circles touch? No. So God does not intersect with creation. Creation does not intersect with God. But then you draw a couple lines from the God circle to the creation and say, but by revelation, by providence, by condescending grace, God can act on his creation. He's not shut out of it, but he's not it. Dr. Rudolph was very fond of one-liners, and one that I enjoyed is, um, God makes ducks, but God doesn't quack. <laughs> by which he simply meant, God makes the universe, but in the process didn't make himself into the universe. He makes ducks, but he didn't become one by making them. God can create without making the creation somehow a metaphysical extension of himself. He is distinct from it. And mm. so these two great warriors of the faith had their own ways of getting across the idea. But the Bible does it by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, heaven and earth. God was there from eternity. And eternity is not simply a very, very long time. It's timelessness. And then God, in the beginning, God created a beginning. And he created matter. He created space three-dimensional space as we understand it. And then into this, he began this process of, of making a world one day at a time. The first day, there's heaven, there's earth, but that first earth didn't look a whole lot like what we know as earth. And so the next several days are God filling it, lighting it up, uh, and ordering and structuring it so it would become more like the world that we know today. See, we made it out of Genesis 1-1. Hey, took a I while. know. I'm so impressed with this. <laughs> Yeah. So pantheism, yay or nay? <laughs> well, let, 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 let's skip. Let, let's get really bold and go into chapter three of Genesis. What? Ooh. We haven't done we chapter to two do that? yet. It's not even twenty thirty eight yet. <laughs> yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> when Satan appears, well, let me actually let, 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 let's talk about Satan just for a second. The, the, this is something I've written about a couple times, but I haven't talked much about it to you or, or, or hardly to anybody outside my writing. You know, there was a time when the, the heavenly host quieted down out of its hallelujahs and looked at the world that spun beneath their feet so full of fish and fowl and light and glory and grass and mountains and looked at one another. And one of them said to another, hey, um, Gabriel. How old is this universe anyway? And how do you know? Because the angels had come online singing the praises of God. 
And oddly enough, as creatures, they didn't know what happened before. God told them. And it seemed absolutely reasonable to believe God because they know they didn't make themselves. And they see God making the universe and in God in some measure revealed himself in their very being. But one of these angels had to ask, what's really going on here? Because if if, if the universe is only so many days old, then God's telling the truth. God made it. He's omniscient, omnipotent, uh, transcendent, sovereign. But what if the universe has kind of always been here and he's just one more being like us? And what if one day he awoke just a little ahead of us and saw us and saw this and said, ha, I've got this plan. The cosmic race to the God chair. <laughs> exactly. The cosmic race to the God chair. If, if Yahweh got there first and he's pulling the cosmic con job of eternity, convincing all of us that he's God, well, then that's not nice and that's not fair. Uh, we're, we're all more or less equal here. Anyway, somehow, in some way, Satan had to come to conclusions much like this. He knew he didn't make himself. He didn't want to believe that God made him because that means God is sovereign and he's going to, stuck, going to be stuck serving God forever. Uh, he probably would not be able to convince the other angels that he, in fact, was the creator. Um, and so what's that leave? It means there is no creator. And so if Yahweh is some sort of God and Satan is some sort of God and these other angels are all some sorts of God, then deity is something inherent in the very universe. Uh, the universe evolves into various forms and powers of which Satan is one and Yahweh is another, the other angels. And these two beings down on this earth thing, this Adam and Eve, um, they're gods too. Why don't we, why don't I go tell them? We can always use more uh, help in the resistance. And so in chapter three of Genesis, we see Satan appearing in the garden in the form of a serpent and, and asks questions about God's integrity and good intentions and all. But eventually when Eve says, well, we've been told if we eat of this one tree, we're, we're going to die. We'll surely die. Satan says, no, you will not surely die. For God doth know the day you eat there, you, sh you, you shall be as God's knowing, your eyes will be open, you'll be as God's knowing good and evil. Well, what's he saying? He's saying God has made a threat. He cannot carry it out. I mean, he might try, and he might be really scary, he might be really powerful, but this is a threat behind it. If this is so, then this implies that God is not the sovereign creator of all things. He has not defined the meaning of the tree by creating it. It's a thing. He's a different kind of thing. He sees it, he covets it, he wants to keep it away from you. But he is just a very powerful force, and you too can be very powerful forces. You can be like God. But notice again that that, that leaves no creator. So where did the world come from? From itself. It is self-existent, self-defining. It, it exists without any kind of superintending. It does not need a God. It is God. It is divine sentience of some sort, forever spewing out new forms and forever resolving themselves back into it. So pantheism. Yeah. The day that Satan appeared, he said, first of all, there's no creator. Satan's an atheist. He says the universe is the source of all deity. He's a pantheist. He says, I'm a God, Jehovah's God, you're God's. He's a polytheist. And he says, but you human beings can be as God and make your own rules. He's a humanist. And this leads inevitably to, and he's a magician. Because if these things are true, then the thing that turns, cranks the wheels of the universe is going to be magic. All of these religions, they're names that we've invented to try to create many variations as if there are all kinds of different possibilities. You could be an atheist, you could be an agnostic, you could be a humanist, you could, be, you could believe in magic, you could be a pantheist or a polytheist. But what we're seeing here is you can either believe in the God of the Bible or you cannot. And not doesn't free you from the reality of that God's existence. It simply opens you up to a million variations on a common theme. You have rejected God. You are an atheist. You believe in your own divinity and the divinity of the world around you. You are a pantheist. You believe in many kinds of powers and forces um, that are inherently divine. You are a polytheist. And you will find yourself sooner or later resorting to some sort of magic and you're humanist. In other words, you worship yourself. You want to play God. This is the nature of sin. This is the nature of every other worldview that isn't Christianity. And in passing, something about apologetics. Dear friends in the faith who, in, in their desire to uh, defend the faith, will say, well, let's just look at all the possible worldviews 
okay, well, that's interesting as far as it goes. But the idea seems to be if we set out all these worldviews and we can look at them one by one and we can pick the one that makes the most sense to us. How high do we have to count to do that? Yeah. <laughs> two? Yeah, two. two. Because the first person to make that suggestion was Satan. All Satan does, Satan doesn't claim to be God. He doesn't claim any particular insight beyond, he just claims to be right. Jehovah says this, I say this, here are two different worldviews. That's all there really are. Pick one. Which one benefits you? Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> pick the one that benefits you the most, that you're the most comfortable with, that makes the most sense to you in your autonomy. Um, and, and this is why you, you can talk about worldview evangelism or worldview apologetics. And, and we're still at some kind of just uh, basic compromise rationalism, where all we are saying is, you know, we'll, we'll look at the presuppositions, but we're still going to leave it up to you in your, in your fallen humanity, in your fallen reason, to pick the thing, to pick the position that you're comfortable with in your sense. And we think that that's going to work, because we cannot imagine that there could be any other choice. Well, and that's the the problem between these these two ways of apologetics, because the one is basically saying that the faith is a matter of logical assent to propositional truth. And the scripture describes the gospel as command. You are commanded to believe on Christ. It's not a it's it's not a uh, debate. It's not an yeah. It's not an alternate product that a salesman <laughs> is trying to sell you on. It's like, oh, you could go with atheism, but Christianity is a pretty good option too, slightly cheaper. But you know, it's 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 not like that. It's the there's the one option, and there's the uh, the Chinese knockoff. <laughs> <laughs> is that a racist slur? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to do it. <laughs> oh dear. But you, um, yeah, you 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 pinned it. It's will we bend the knee to our creator, knowing that he is in fact our creator, not having to be convinced. We already start there. We, we, we know who he is. We may want to pretend we don't. Uh, you know, the, the, the new atheists who, who rage and rail so much upon our God. Isn't it funny that it's our God they rail upon? Mm-hmm. It's funny, isn't it funny that they hate him so much, even so though... personally. By, so personally, even though by their reckoning he does not exist and could not exist, and they're very angry with him for existing and for not existing at the same time. But they don't get excited about Odin or Ra or, or um, a great spirit of, of Native American theology. It's just this one particular God who reveals himself in Christ in the scripture that they are angry, horribly angry with. And and even if they, they happen to get angry at, you know, uh, Islam or mm. or even Mormonism or things like that that it's it's very rarely a complaint against the deity at the center of that religion it is right. always about the the institution you know the Mormons are weird they're yeah. a cult the yeah. the few people that speak out against uh Islam talk about you know how uh Muhammad was this horrible man and they never ever talk about Allah yeah no, because that's not where they're invested. But since man fell, well, we look at Adam and we're back in chapter three. Um, Eve eats the forbidden fruit, gives it to her husband. And they both eat and they both realize that something is horribly wrong. And so they they try to cover up. They make fig leaves for themselves to hide amongst the trees. When God comes, they start blame shifting. But at each point, they... Despite what Satan says, God can't carry out his threats. They, are pretty, they act like people who are pretty sure God can carry out his threats. And at the same time, they're acting like they can get around God. God is really powerful, but we can lie to him and he'll believe us. Um, God's, God can carry out his threats, but if we do a great con job and throw each other under the bus, maybe we won't be caught in all of this. It's, it's this basic contradiction. Uh, because man is the image of God, he can't get away from that, nor, but nor can he accept it. And he's constantly caught in this internal warfare of knowing the God who is, and yet not wanting to know the God who is, of believing in him and hating him, hating him so much that he insists he can't be there. And, and given this, there's no point in trying to convince people that God exists. They know. 
what all we can do is point out that all of their excuses are a bunch of nonsense and all of their reasonings is foolishness and that it all leads nowhere that we're, we're left with dust in the wind and then they have to decide what they're going to do with that they, they they're trying to be as gods and we can show them step by step that they've got nothing left they have no absolutes they have no basis for community communication love beauty for morality for law for justice for human rights you know, pick whatever their particular picadillo is. We are all about women's rights. Okay, why? We don't think you should abuse children, but neither do we. But why? Uh, we believe you should always tell the truth. Oh, really? Why? <laughs> the words why, how do you know this, define your terms, and what in the world do you mean by that, are very powerful weapons. As we just keep, we don't have to take a stand at this point. We can just keep pushing back because they claim to have all the truth. And they will walk themselves into a dark corner where God's light doesn't shine except it does. And they'll know that. And they'll know nobody ever accepts a world of no absolutes, of no truth. They may say they do, but even in the midst of that, there is still the image of God that will not completely acknowledge it. And somewhere in here is where we say, now let me tell you what Jesus did to save you. And if God wills, and if the Holy Spirit uses the message to open their heart, transformation and new birth can, will happen. But trying to convince them by some kind of logical argument that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life is so beside the point. I'm I'm doing a, a series of articles now on, uh, I forget what I call it, but uh, unassailable evidence. I'm writing about all the times when people stood before God, like Satan, like Adam and Eve. Cain's the one I'm working on tonight. Where they actually talked with God or God's immediate representative, thinking here of Pharaoh and the whole, the miracles that brought off the Exodus, or the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai, they talk to God and they still don't believe in him. And of course, the, the most wonderful example, well, one of the, the, oh, the, the, the just one, one step short of the most wonderful example is the, um, the rich man in the parable of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. parable the story the history of lazarus jesus says there was a man named lazarus okay so there was a man named lazarus this is not an invented story this is history that jesus knew about being god and all and as you the more you read the, the the account the more amazing it is here's the rich man in hell he never admits where he is he, he acknowledges it it's it's not pleasant it's a place of torment he believes and confesses that there's a way out he never admits he never mentions god he does not pray to God. He does not confess his sins nor repent of them in any fashion. He prays to a saint, to Abraham, and he does his best to get Lazarus out of heaven to continue the kind of relationship they had before where, where Lazarus is just his lackey doing whatever errand he needs. And if he can just get the powers to be to acknowledge that he was there because he didn't have enough evidence. So send Lazarus back to my brothers and, and, and tell them about this horrible place. Abraham says, they don't, that's not necessary. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. No, Father Abraham, but if one rose from the dead, they will believe. In other words, if I had that kind of evidence, then surely I would believe, being a reasonable man. And Abraham says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, they will not believe, no one rose from the dead. In a short time later, Jesus raises another man named Lazarus from the dead, and the religious leaders set about trying to kill Lazarus because they see that this is just way too much evidence in Jesus' favor. So he's got to go. Clearly it'll stick this time. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't kill you hard enough this time. How many times do I have to kill you, boy? And then, of course, at the end of the Gospels, when the Roman soldiers come to the Sadducees and say, tombs, tombs open, angel blasted away the thing, he's gone. The Sadducees do not say, wow, this is incontrovertible proof. We finally have the evidence we need. We've been so wrong. We need to go find this man and bow before him. They say, here's money, tell no one. We'll cover it up. If hell is not sufficient evidence, if people in hell still don't believe in God, if the Sadducees who knew the scriptures and who had first-hand witnesses bearing witness to the resurrection, if they did not believe, there's nothing we can do in the form of argument to convince people to believe in the God they already know and hate. And so we, as you say, presuppose God. We begin with God. We begin with God's revelation of himself. We begin exactly where Genesis does. 
and we're not ashamed. But we do this by faith. We do this in grace, not because we're so smart and clever, but because God in his providence and his predestinating grace chose to save us. And our response can simply be, thank you, Lord, because we are not worthy. Yes. So the school of apologetics, the presuppositional apologetics, is famously, what do you call it, developed, expounded chiefly by... Uh, anyway, Ventil is the guy for presuppositional apologetics. Dr. Cornelius Ventil, very late professor of um, apologetics at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. I don't remember when he died. I did live long enough uh, to meet him very briefly at a conference someplace in California. I remember, I think it was Southern California. He was already an old man, and his mind was not very clear anymore. But I got him to sign a book. And I got to shake his hand. And he, was, he was a wonderful, yes. wonderful gentleman. And he got up to, to preach. And as I say, his mind was not very clear at that point, but it was so full of scripture that he mm -hmm. just started talking. And every passage led to another passage, just verse after verse, passage after passage, ranging all through scripture. That was how he thought. He, he, he wasn't talking philosophy. He wasn't talking Plato or Kant. He was talking the Bible all the way through. It's wonderful. Although he could talk Plato and Kant. Oh, and, and abso absolutely yeah. could. And, and in his books, you might think that that's all he ever did. <laughs> um, in his books, are, points are sometimes quite difficult if you don't know the sources. And sometimes even if you do know the sources, because he usually <laughs> he usually makes that leap up. Well, if they say this, they intend this, or they assume this, or they imply this. So let's just begin with that. And we're left saying, wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> How did you get there? You're, you're like three steps ahead of us already. Could you slow down? He, he didn't always. And yeah. so some people have come along and tried to, to bridge the gap for us. And maybe we'll do, be doing a little of that as we go along. Yeah. My pastor in Hillsdale, when he found out I was interested in Van Til, he said, if you're going to read Van Til, you need either an undergraduate degree in philosophy <laughs> or, or you need Greg Bonson's a compilation of his work and Bonson does a fantastic job yes. of making Ventil's arguments a little more linear so they're <laughs> easier to it's enter because yes. like when you're reading Ventil himself which I have done you just kind of have to jump in with both feet and stick with it until it makes sense but uh, <laughs> if you have Bonson to sort of hold your hand along the way it, it makes it a bit easier but there isn't there a shorter book because that that book is the numbers of hundreds of pages. Dr. Bonson has a couple of books. Always Ready, I think, is the name of one of them. Again, this can be in the show notes because I would mm -hmm. actually have to go into my library and pull the book. Uh, but I think that's that's the one I have. Dr. Ventil himself wrote a summary of a summary. He he took Defense of the Faith and summarized it down into a very small syllabus that's more of an um, outline form. And I know that uh, within my denomination, which is the Reformed Church of the United States, candidates for uh, examination for the ministry will often be handed this and said, this is all you need. Read this over five times. And if you can get this, you, you'll, you'll get through the apologetics part of the examination. I, I think that's true. I'm not sure that simply reading through it is really going to give you a great deal of depth. But it does exist. It's just called Apologetics. It's by Van Phil. And... Um, recommend that to anybody who's interested. Uh, there are some other books here and there, but there's one by a man named Jim Halsey that I read when I was young, but he's not the smoothest writer either. Better than, more linear, you would say, than Van Til. Um, of course, there's Dr. Bonson. Dr. Bonson is often, he he thinks very A, B, C, D, E, but he ends someplace around X, Y, Z. <laughs> very detailed. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. if, you want, if you want thoroughness, Greg Watson is the one, one to follow here. So, yes, we recommend all of these. And I think we recommend that you you, you look at it uh, on the Look Inside feature, feature in Amazon and read a few pages before you buy it. I know people have just bought the whole, the whole kit and caboodle and then realized, I can't make sense of any of this. I think Every Thought Captive is another one that I've heard recommended. Um, yeah. It's designed for younger people, but I'm a teacher of younger people, and I'm not thrilled with it. If you, if, for those oh. who've read it, if they, if they've, have you read it, Emily? Or any? If you I have not. You read it? I, I read it in I read it in school, and it was it was okay. Uh, I I don't think it it didn't yeah. like leave any profound effect on me. But then again, I think I was 15 when I read it, so very few things did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So I, 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 I don't disrecommend it. I, there's nothing wrong with it. I, we, we're constantly looking for the book that we can <laughs> hand to young people and say, read this and you'll get it all. And I don't think it's been written yet. Or maybe it has, and it's just not written by human hands. <laughs> yeah, but uh, as far as a as a, a simple guide for teenagers or new believers, I, there's no one thing at this point that I would recommend besides the, for the kind of things we've talked about. But reading the Bible would seem to be a really good thing. And if we get used to reading the Bible rather than reading books of evidences, we've 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 come a long way. And while we do need to think in terms of worldviews, at least to some point, again, what people need is not a philosophical argument. They need the gospel. Uh, there's a story, I wish I remembered all the details. A man, a man comes to his pastor and says, this really famous, important professor is coming to town and he's going to come to our church. And could you just, could you just make sure that you, you speak to him where he is? Because you know, he's smart and intellectual and has PhDs and stuff. And the pastor smiles and says, I'm exactly the man he needs to hear. And so when the man came, all the preacher did was preach the gospel the same way he did every Sunday. And our intellectual professor came to faith in Christ. Because it's not about arguing. It's about the spirit of God breaking through the hardness of the human heart and turning the lights on. And I've been amazed in reading scripture, especially the the prophets, how many mm-hmm. times the author speaks for humans in their sinfulness mm. and says the things that they'd say and then responds to it. Yes. So like we don't have to make up responses. We don't have to find <laughs> the arguments. They're there if we know them. Like God has already answered them. Yes. God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. So at the point that we made in our in our first podcast and something we're going to go on making is if we want to convince anybody of anything to this podcast, it's simply this. Read your Bible. Mm-hmm. Read it not in the mystical, devotional sense of, I will read these three verses and I will get my orders for today and they will tell me exactly what to do. And we all know the story. Random finger down. Jesus went out and hung himself. Finger down again. What, Haley's correcting me. How should I say it? Jesus. Oh, this is Judas. Jesus, Judas. So the story is we put down our uh, our finger on a text to find the will of God for today. And it's Jesus. I don't did it again. <laughs> Judas went out and hung himself. <laughs> Judas went out and hung himself. And we say, no, that can't possibly be it. And we open randomly and put our finger down another verse. And the verse says, go thou and do likewise. And so we say, no, that's that's really beside the point. We put our foot, our foot, our finger down on yet another verse, and it says, "What you do, do quickly." <laughs> that's that's not re- that's exactly what reading the Bible isn't. Mm-hmm. Reading the Bible means you read it, uh, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, like another piece of literature, where you begin at the beginning, you follow its arguments, its themes. Uh, verse by verse, step by step, page by page, until you reach the end and you let it speak for itself, believing that what it says is what it means. And that's what we want people to do. You know, if they listen to us and say, I don't believe any of that stuff. Well, great. Go pick up a Bible and read it yourself, starting in the beginning and working through all the pieces and all the parts and all the themes and all the sub-themes and all the subplots, and let the Bible define its own categories and its own give it definitions of its words. And then find out what it's really saying. And when Mm. you have done, you will, uh, at the very least, be a whole lot more accountable than you were when you started this project. And yet it may be that God will use this very thing to open your heart to the gospel. That's how Francis Schaeffer says he became a Christian. He picked up the Bible not because he was interested in theology as such, but because he was interested in philosophy. He's reading Plato and Aristotle at the time. And he wanted to do intellectual justice to what everyone else believed, which is to say scripture. And so he picked it up and just started reading it in order. And little by little, he began to see that the questions that the Greek philosophers raised were exactly the things that the Bible answered. But this is the work of God. This is not because he was so smart, um, because he's had some kind of intellectual beliefs the rest of us don't have. It's simply because God uses his word to change human hearts. And so this God who created out of nothing creates anew by his word and spirit. The God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give us the the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, If we believe in a God who creates out of nothing, then we believe in a God who can take 
a black and dead human heart and create it anew as something beautiful and wonderful. So this we keep telling people. And if there is going to be a theme to all this, let it be that and let the word of God, as we sow the seed, let the word of God grow under the springs of the spirit as he brings refreshing rains and storms and floods and carries it and us wherever he wants to. On that that same vein, talking about God, God is the one who brings the increase. It's not it's not by uh, much wisdom or much argument. It is entirely by the Spirit of God. A, a sermon that is preached faithfully but somewhat objectively badly can mm-hmm. be used by God more to his purpose of election than a sermon that is preached eloquently but without any faithfulness to it. And God is pleased to use such a means. Mm-hmm. You know, once once we've established that it is God who is the hero, God the chief actor, God the creator, the God who moves the story along, then we realize that um, we don't have to supplement that. Man is dead in a sense. Man's heart is a wasteland. We don't need to go to try to pull some kind of life out of the deadness. God can do that, but we can't. So when we look upon the Valley of Dry Bones, we don't need to entertain the bones. We don't need to engage the bones in logical <laughs> discourse. We do not need to present them with all with volumes and volumes of information. We need to say, oh, you bones, hear the word of the Lord. And then let God's creative power change the universe. Go, going back to um, the, this, this theme of uh, continuity of being versus, versus creation. From a Christian point of view, from the Bible's point of view, God is sovereign over his creation. If life is going to come, God himself is life and God gives life. And the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is the one who regenerates and resurrects and brings life. And he uses means as he chooses. On the other hand, from a pagan point of view, life is. Everything's alive. Everything's living. If, if, the, universe, if, if the universe is anywhere, then life can spout sprout up right there just because uh, there's no surprise that life comes out of dead things. We, we look at evo- a secular evolution. There is no way in terms of any classical principle of science that life should be able to come out of, new, out of non-life. Pasteur slew the idea of spontaneous, spontaneous generation back in the mid-1800s. And yet, without a blink of an eye, most scientists today will say, well, of course life came out of non-life. What else could happen? That's not a rational argument. That's not a scientific argument. That's a religious assumption. And it's an assumption that the universe itself generates life because it just does. It's a worship of, of matter, of life, of the universe, of nature. Nature is this ongoing self-procreating thing, this ever-evolving thing that, that, is, that is itself living. We, um, uh, as Christians, we speak of the virgin birth, and we know that that means that there was no way that Mary's womb could be with child on her own. She could she could grin and scream and grind her teeth and tighten her muscles and yell and jump up and down, and she would never get pregnant. It's just impossible. But when God plants life there, life happens. In the pagan pantheons, there were a whole lot of virgin goddesses who had a whole lot of kids. And it wasn't because something outside of them necessarily intervened, but it was because it's the very nature of deity to give birth. So both Christianity and the pagan world had virgin births, but they meant exactly the opposite thing. For scripture, virgin birth means humanity is a dead end, literally. We can't bring forth the Savior. This is what circumcision testified to. The, there's no hope in the flesh. There's no hope in natural generation. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. We must be born again, and the Messiah must be born by a miracle. But as far as the pantheistic, animistic world is concerned, oh, life out of death, no problem. It happens all the time. That's the nature of reality. Because that's all they've got. They, they, there is no appeal beyond creation. And so if there is life, it must be the nature of nature to produce it. And so again, we're looking at two absolutely opposite systems. And they would like to claim, oftentimes, that their system is logical and scientific. And they get very mad at us when we point out, um, no, it, it, it actually isn't. Those are religious assumptions for which you have absolutely no grounds. 
Yeah. Uh, again, we're falling back on presuppositional apologetics. And for those of you out there who may never have heard this way of thinking or arguing before, we hope this is useful and a blessing. And yeah, we kind of talk around in circles because that's that's the nature of this thing. When you're fighting one-on-one -on -one with someone on the battlefield before there were guns where you just pick it up and shoot it at a distance, you know, you, you, you would pace around and you would try to get around each other and you'd, you'd swing at the side and then at the flank and then at the back and you just keep going. And that's what a lot of this is. In, in, in real conversations, you rarely have a straight line dialogue with your adversary that logically pokes through everything. You just keep coming back. Wait, no, that's cheating. Where'd you get that idea? Now, that's a Christian idea. Can't use that. Wait, wait what do you mean by that? Find your terms. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. That's not what you said earlier. And we just keep going and going and in some place inserting, look, can you just be quiet for a moment? Let me tell you what I believe. And then you can t try to tear it to pieces. But I've listened to you, mm -hmm. trying to help you understand what you believe. Here's what the Bible says. And so we're going to do a lot with this podcast and simply saying, this is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. We are going to be faithful to Scripture. And let's clarify that it sounds a little bit annoying to be the two-year-old saying, why, 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 why? <laughs> um and people will get annoyed because well, that, that yes. is what we're doing. Hopefully we're doing it in a better manner, though, so that what they're really getting annoyed at is the fact that they don't have answers rather than because we as people are being annoying to them. Like, let them be annoyed at the right things here. Yeah, um, I have a tendency of cutting to the chase and being black and white. The, the essence of what I'm saying is ask why. What that looks like in real life is be sweet and winsome, cautious, humble. Do y'all remember Columbo? Yeah. Yeah. Was that before your time? One more thing. <laughs> one more thing, man. Just one more thing before I go. You know, it sounds a little bit like Socrates, too. Um, <laughs> Dr. Howard Hendricks, who was um, professor of practical theology in Dallas when I was a kid, I am told that he had a way of dealing with students in his class who spouted heresy, an unmeaning heresy. They'd come up with some brilliant idea and say, Dr. Hendricks, I just realized this. Isn't it true that thus and so and so? And rather than say, tell them that's utter heresy, you know, that's Arianism or that's Historianism or something. <laughs> that's modalism, yeah, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> that's modalism, Patrick. He would say, that's a fantastic idea. Let's just look at that for a minute. <laughs> and he would proceed with all bonding humility to let them think through their idea out loud while everybody watched <laughs> and then hang themselves hoist what's the phrase hoist themselves by their own petard hang themselves by their own noose sometimes we just have to be sweet and polite but 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 that's not being honest look it's a battle we're trying to save a soul we, we can there are various kinds of politeness there are times when just real simple humility and just, just and the plea please just keep talking to me okay Find your trips. Okay, let's keep going. It's fine. There are other times when you answer a fool according to his folly. There are two verses in Proverbs that you're all familiar with. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest uh, he be wise in his own conceits. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like unto him. So do we answer or don't we? Well, the point is you, you answer in a way that makes the man's folly apparent, but not in a way that con where you are condescending to his level and, and, and honoring his foolishness as if it somehow was intelligent. Uh, Dr. Moody, uh, the 19th century evangelist, was some kind of banquet sitting at a table when a man walked up to him and said, Dr. Moody, where did Cain get his wife? Now, Dr. Moody knew the answer. I think we all do. He married his sister. Rather than answer, Dr. Woody picked up on the man's spirit. The man's spirit was antagonistic. It lacked any kind of humility. He was not asking to find out. Um, and so Dr. Woody snapped back, Mr. I wouldn't go to hell worrying about another man's wife. An appropriate answer there, but not an appropriate answer all the time. There are times when you simply want to say, well, it's really easy. He married his sister. Ooh, yeah, I know, but these things were different. Then. And then you can, you can have a nice, pleasant conversation. Dr. Moody was also an Arminian. And many Calvinists gave him heat for that, rightly so. But one man, probably someone who thought he was a Calvinist, walked up to Dr. Moody and said, Dr. Moody, I do not approve of your, ev ev your evangelistic techniques. And Dr. Moody said, neither do I. Please share with me yours. But I'm bum. Again, not the appropriate response all the time. There are people who 
who you want to be gentle with. And there are other people who are hard hearted and stubborn that you, you want to stop dead in their tracks. On a very different theme, we can think of, uh, of our beloved Winston Churchill, <laughs> Prime Minister. That revered you. theologian? <laughs> Question mark? No, not theologian, just Prime Minister. Woman walks up and says to Winston Churchill, Prime Minister, you are drunk. And she, he says, and you, ma'am, are ugly. And tomorrow I'll be sober. <laughs> you know, there, there are ways to shut people down. And there are ways to encourage people when God may be working in their heart. There are people who are naive and will listen. There are people who are stubborn and need to be stopped in their tracks so that they can listen. And it's wisdom to discern the difference. And so sometimes it is going to be why. Explain. Define your terms. No, that's cheating. Other times it's going to be, okay, all right. So then that would mean what now? All right, that's good. All right, get you. Are you saying this? You are. Okay. So if I'm understanding you, then that would lead to this. No. Okay. You don't like that. All right. So <laughs> both cases, you're saying why, but one, you're being nice and one, you're trying to silence a fool. And the Bible recognizes both things. Jesus has, a, we, could, we could go, of course, to Jesus and all of the times that he had the perfect answer for people. Compare the way he dealt with the, the woman of Samaria with how he dealt with Nicodemus with how he dealt with the, oh, the man who says, and who is my neighbor? Let me tell you a story. <laughs> but he always had answers. Yeah, this, this man had multiple, or this woman had multiple husbands. You do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Or how about this, this money? Should we pay taxes? You hypocrite, show me the money. <laughs> Jesus did not always play nice, but he could read human hearts. We need to be a little more careful because we don't have his omniscience. Yeah. Yeah, and the there there's kind of an annoying trend among what I, what I would call the uh, the internet presuppositionalists um, <laughs> to essentially the, treat the internet version of whatever we're talking about. Yeah, is more annoying than the real life version. It is objectively <laughs> uh, is to basically treat presuppositionalism as a get out of jail apologetics card. Mm -hmm. um, instead of what I would think and what we've been discussing here is the proper usage. It's, it's, it's part of having a conversation. It's not a repeat the question by what standard until they get annoyed <laughs> and walk <laughs> away guns. and you declare victory. Uh, it is, yeah, finger guns as well. Uh, it's actually having a conversation and mm -hmm. trying to get them to admit it themselves and yeah. being strategic because just saying you're, you're wrong and you don't have a standard without showing them that yeah. is a is a tactical and strategic loss. It's not it's not even a stalemate. Yeah, the conversation hasn't begun. I declare in advance that I have won and that all of your arguments are ineffective. I will now retire to the glories of victory. I've mentioned Dr. Francis Schaefer a number of times. He was not strictly speaking a presuppositionalist, or he, although he talked a lot about presuppositions. But he was someone who practiced a very winsome, warm form of Christianity. He was mm -hmm. willing to talk to people. He mm. was willing to carry on conversations from here to forever, as long as people were participating and thinking and working their way through ideas. Uh, and he would do it over you know, a mug of beer or a cup of tea or whatever. Uh, and and we, we, we can learn from this. We can learn to be human. Uh, yeah. we, we were lost souls. And we don't have any any claims to moral or spiritual superiority except that Jesus died for us. And we don't know what God may have planned for that soul we're talking to. It may be that God will use us to win that soul, but we have to talk and we have to care. I, I, I've written someplace that if there were one set of words that would infallibly bring about conversion in the human heart, then we would take those words and we would text them, forward them, publish them, print them, skywrite them everywhere, and never once get involved with another human person the way Jesus did. And God's mm -hmm. not left us that option. Mm -hmm. uh, there, 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 there are no pat answers. There are just heartfelt discussions drawing upon the wisdom that we have from Scripture. But then and we're back to it. But that means you have to know the Bible, and you have to be able to come 
from all of that the Bible has, bringing up whatever reserves you need for this encounter, for this discussion, for this person, with this person's own heartaches and needs and frustrations and, yes, animosity toward God. Uh, and, and so God will use us. I've heard Ventilians accused many times of, yeah, you know how to do apologetics, you just never do it. Mm -hmm. well, that's, if there's any truth in that, that's really bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we need to be people who care about other people uh, because Jesus certainly did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we are way over time, so we have to. I kept hoping we might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for this, yes. this discussion. It's been great. Uh, thanks to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, if you would like to send us an email, write in a question to the show, you can send us an email at haltingtourdzion at gmail.com. Fun feature. Ooh. All right. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.